glad to, to see everybody here. This panel was a, a happy opportunity for me to learn a little bit more about open educational resources. I'm uh, new and coming back to the university press. I'd been here for 13 years previously and uh, had started at Mississippi in 2008, which was the, the year of the recession, uh, which also ended up representing a huge sea change in a lot of things in scholarly communication and certainly for publishers. It was the advent of a lot of um, electronic books, uh, e-readers, uh, all of us having no money and having to rethink how we printed things, uh, moving to digital printing, uh, DDA, PDA programs, uh, collection development change simultaneously in libraries, which also affected publishers. Um, and in the middle of this, I think really the open access movement was taking off and also attendant with that, the open educational resources. So it's, it's been an exciting eight years. Uh, and I'm, I'm very glad to be back. Our press is connected with the UK libraries and I think that's a very, useful connection and a way for us to, to work together to think about uh, larger issues of scholarly communication on the campus and, and what role we can each play. So textbooks, uh, you know, I, I don't have specific experience through our press publishing main textbooks, the, you know, the, uh, the general chemistry textbooks uh, that Allison oversees for her unit or, you know, the biology. 101, uh, but we do a lot with what would be considered ancillary textbooks. Uh, so, you know, when you say textbook, it can mean many different things uh, from, you know, your, your general ed, very large enrollment courses to more specialized two, three, 400 level courses that may have, you know, 15, 20 students enrolled. One of the things that we've been seeing, certainly in our sector, and I, I know uh, commercial textbook publishers are also seeing this, textbook sales are down very significantly um, since the, the advent of the recession. Uh, I think it was three or four years ago, there was a, a fascinating, if depressing, two-page spread in the Chronicle of Higher Education where they interviewed 20 students about, you know, how do you, how do you get your textbooks was the question that had the little student picture and showed, you know, their, their answers to this, which ranged from oh, I don't buy the textbook, it's too expensive, I find a, a legal copy online and use that, I share the textbook with five or six friends, you know, they, I think it was maybe one in eight students who actually, you know, purchased the textbook for the class, so that presents a number of problems, both related to student success, issues, issues for publishers figuring out, you know, how do we reach students with resources that make sense. Um, and so I think the, the open education movement uh, was smart to, to see this as a moment where you know, we can develop uh, meaningful educational resources that can be free and accessible, uh, and, and so they they're, uh, solve problems. Um, certainly faculty are looking also for, if they're teaching some of these more specialized courses, there may not be a particular textbook that does exactly what the professor wants, or a professor may prefer to, re, you know, there's a, a textbook that could work, but they would really rather reorder the text um, and have it presented in a different way. Uh, many professors, in light of expensive textbooks and wanting to have greater student access, will look to um, public domain editions, but then you have an issue with, you know, if you're talking about uh, in a literature class, oh, you know, in, on page 123, this character says whatever, if everyone's using a different edition of the book, that creates obvious problems. So, a lot of professors, I think, are very aware. They want students to all be using the text uh, that they assign, but you know what's what's preventing these faculty from just all developing uh, these fantastic open educational resources? And I, I think there are several issues. Professors are increasingly teaching uh, heavier loads. They feel like it will take a lot of time to develop something from scratch, uh, particularly for some of the large enrollment classes. You know. I, was talking to uh, someone in Ohio who was working with uh, some of their open textbook and the state legislature had actually gotten involved and said, you know, we want uh, textbooks developed for a lot of these gen ed courses, high enrollment. And the projection was that it was gonna take something like six to eight years uh, with X number of faculty to develop these sorts of things. So I think there's a lot of fear uh, connected with the prospect of taking these things on, just that uh, they'll, they'll take a lot of time. Funding, I think all everyone in this room uh, and the, the open access and open education movement has come far enough to realize, you know, 
E or open does not automatically equal free or that there is no cost in putting these resources together. So I think things like the what's being developed at UK grant type of programs really are helping address uh, the fact that even creating these open resources does take funding for various aspects of licensing or other, other things that uh, overhead and time actually has to go into these projects. Quality materials, I know especially uh, I heard from a lot of publishers and authors at the beginning of the real bigger discussions about open access. Um, professors still like, to some extent, you know, choosing their books. They worry, are textbooks, open textbooks being vetted, you know, in the way that I feel like a commercial textbook has already been vetted, so those are, are those the textbook rigorous enough? Does it represent the latest thinking in the field? Uh, one of the things textbooks publishers have done to preserve market share, uh, and, and Allison was talking about this last night, you know, the, the continual publishing in new editions, uh, both as a, a way of sustaining the, the finances of, say, a for-profit textbook company, but also uh, in fields that do change rapidly or where um, new information needs to be incorporated into, into new editions. I think that's something rightly on faculty's minds. Student engagement. Uh, again, a lot of the commercial textbooks do come with ancillary materials, homework sets, um, other online resources that I think it is sometimes a little bit harder for um, people putting together open sources to replicate. Uh, you know, you can't avoid the fact textbook publishers do have a lot of money and resources to play with. Um, they can do things uh, taking advantage of iterative learning and problem sets and things like that that um, I think we're, we're still trying to maybe figure out how to match uh, from the open, open educational resources movement. However, uh, there, there are solutions. There is education and help available to make this whole process seem less daunting. And just in being in conversation with Allison and with a, another uh, professor, and I'll, I'll talk about her work in just a minute, I think there are really a lot of uh, very approachable and relatively easy solutions to, to some of these issues or, or worries. The UK libraries, I was very impressed with the libguides they have um, put together on uh, how to, you know, approach the topic of open educational resources. Uh, you know, FAQs, resources from other universities. There are projects, uh, open resources being put together on this campus, but there is a huge network across the country of, uh, you know, link with links from our website to these great uh, guides to OER resources, links to textbooks. Uh, the, the site here has faculty sort of talking, you know, case studies basically saying, here's how I put something together, you know, it is, it is doable. So I think a lot of that demystifies um, the, the process and again, an explanation of, of grant funding to help meet the financial piece of this. Um, one of the other things in talking with Mary Beth and Adrian that I think is important to know, there can often be hybrid solutions to these open resources as well. It, it may not be that a faculty person needs to write or create uh, an entire textbook from scratch. It may be a matter of using resources that the library has already licensed. I think um, you know, this is a great way. This is money and investment uh, that's already been made in various types of materials, and the library can help guide and, and uh, work out the licensing issues where those materials can be incorporated into uh, an open resource uh, textbook for a particular class. And sometimes I think, you know, in addressing the time issue, the, those kind of hybrid solutions uh, may be less time consuming and a little easier to implement more quickly. Robin DeRosa was a, a person who was recommended to me as somebody who's been working in this space, and she was very inspirational in, in my talking with her because I think she is the, a great example of somebody who, uh, you know, she was just an English professor when she started uh, developing open resources. She realized her students were paying uh, money that sometimes they might not have had for what was essentially public domain materials, and so she thought, okay, what, what can I do about this? She didn't have any funds. She was teaching a 4-4 load, so it's not like... She had a, a mandate from the administration or a lot of uh, resources or time, but within the course of a semester, she um, put together this textbook and uh, she used a Pressbooks platform. She's particularly attached to sort of web-based things, I think, for accessibility, and she finds that that's easier to deal with in terms of the students she's working with. 
um, and just ease of accessibility, uh, especially from, you know, so many of the students are, are working remotely. She basically trained her students to do the work for her. Uh, I know this, uh, in talking with Allison uh, last night, I think she's, this is a, a really good way to both involve the students in the process and also to lighten the load on the professor. So the, she said the students were very happy to save the money. They went out, she taught them how to find these things. They, they put the first version of this, uh, this book together. But she did notice the students were not really in love with the first iteration of the, of the textbook. Uh, they were happy to have something they didn't have to pay $85 for, but there were things that were missing. And so with the second semester that she did this experiment, um, she really worked with them to um, add some things to improve the textbook. And so she thought of it as a development pro developmental process. Uh, she used a lot of student feedback, and it was kind of a continually improving thing. The ancillary materials were a big thing that the students pointed out uh, that they missed. So again, she put them to work and had them, each according to their own interests or strengths, uh, building out the supplemental materials for the textbook. So they were doing you know, videos, maps, uh, section introductions. You know, She was sort of following their lead and what type of materials and support things they were used to seeing in a textbook and really wanted and missed, and so she had them build that out. Uh, and in some ways, sort of like a digital humanities playground uh, that she basically was uh, let, letting them, uh, unleashing them on and letting them create simultaneously. She, uh, again, brought technology to her aid and used the Hypothesis app, uh, sort of overlaid this on top of the web-based book, and really encouraged the, the social sharing and interaction part of the process. And she said the students really latched onto that. Within the course of one semester, she had 10,000 um, annotations. So you know, the students really bought into that part. And the way she structured it, you know, by getting the students involved in this way and the, the social sharing and annotation aspect, she said what she realized is that it was the textbook that became the real centerpiece of the entire class. And she said, usually <clears throat> that's very much not the case. And the students will either complain about the textbook or think about the textbook as an afterthought. And it really became, became the heart of what the students were doing. And that resulted in an extremely high level of student buy-in, she said, on the course evaluations. Almost every student said the textbook was my favorite part of this class, uh, which again is something maybe you, you don't often hear. Um, and, and this does seem really well suited for a generation of students who are used to collaborative learning environments and, and sort of thrive uh, in that space. And they also really liked the fact that they felt like they were building something that would go just beyond their class. So now um, this textbook has, has been made openly available and it's at use at several other institutions. And she said the students really took a lot of value away from that. You know, that you know, they liked it, but they also feel like you know, they're, they're building something bigger than themselves uh, or just for that class. So in, in thinking about, uh, if you're ready to, to jump in to, to one of these projects, uh, I asked Robin, you know, what, uh, what would you say faculty need to think about as, as they're going into this process? She said there, there are several things. Uh, metadata, this is something that I know publishers and libraries are talk, spend a lot of time talking about, metadata. Those, uh, the keywords, descriptions of what type of object uh, you're, you're looking at, creating its origin, licensing information on how it can be used or shared. Um, this is metadata in a lot of ways uh, for both publishers and libraries is, is sort of our, our most valuable currency. I think sometimes um, with open resources, metadata is a little bit of an issue, and Robin said, you know, properly created, uh, a, a properly created Creative Commons license can solve a lot of this because in creating the license, you create good and solid metadata, so this helps alleviate uh, that issue. Hosting and discoverability uh, is, is another thing, whether it's you know, a web link or a discrete textbook that you've created. Um, I like to think of, or I often think of the metaphor, you know, if a tree falls in the forest but no one is there to hear it. And I, I think sometimes, uh, depending on what uh, an institutional repository may look like. You know, you can create these things, put it up, but 
Uh, does anyone know about it sort of outside the system? I, th I think a lot of things happen here at UK and with many IRs that, that help uh, work to disseminate metadata, increase discoverability, but that's not necessarily always the case. So she really encouraged faculty to work directly with their libraries and their institutions to make sure that the, the hosting was done in such a way that these things are as open and discoverable uh, as we would all like them to be. You know, so much effort goes into creating the, the product that um, it, it should be widely shared. And, and she had an interesting, you know, who, who's sort of responsible for this uh, open material? And in her mind, it broke out very clearly, you know, the faculty is in charge of the, the content, the purview, the intellectual, um, the intellectual content that's created, you know, what really should be in this textbook, but that it's really in collaboration then with the library and other, uh, depending on your campus, other uh, tech resources to make sure that the licensing and the hosting part uh, really is, is done um, in ways that, that make these books work in terms of accessibility, uh, both from the campus level, but also more widely. And I just listed um, one of the more compelling things, too, that she talked about. I said, you know, it's speaking with you. You know, I'm, I'm a fan. This, you can tell your enthusiasm uh, for this topic. You know, why aren't more people doing, creating these open educational resources? And she said, really, the main thing is very few faculty know about them, or more faculty should know about them. So uh, she said it's the promotional aspect that's sort of the first hurdle. Um, and she spent a lot of time talking about um, legislatures, you know, have gotten involved in the issue of textbook costs. A lot of times administrations will uh, talk about OERs from the, the point of um, student success, and she said really uh, what makes more sense uh, for her and where she finds a much greater uptake from the faculty is when you approach these open resources from the pedagogical uh, point of view. And I think we're going to hear more about that today. And the, the taking the pedagogy approach solves a number of problems. Students are doing the bulk of the work, um, and, and she found she really liked the, the, the creative and collaborative learning that this fostered within the classroom, um, and, and also critical thinking, you know, building some of the skills that she really felt um, that did her students the greatest service you know, as, as part of an educational process. She's such a fan. She's currently working on more textbooks. She's actually shifted a little bit and now is in a, a different administrative role and is also um, teaching interdisciplinary studies classes. And she said this area, again, is perfect because you know, interdisciplinary studies can be defined you know, a thousand different ways depending on, on what uh, fields you're putting together. So she said this, uh, to her, again, is, is a perfect way to really um, create a textbook that that works for the very specific subjects that she would like to teach. And finally, she said really what she found is the most effective way to, to get buy-in on a campus level was just having faculty champions. Um, she said, you know, yes, an administration can spend a lot of time talking to you about, you know, why we should do these things, but she said, you know, the more compelling thing is just having faculty who are actually doing this process and show that it can work uh, without being disruptive uh, to their way of teaching in their lives and that it can have really beneficial results and that the, the students are, are happier with it and more engaged. And so just uh, these will, Adrian, thankfully we'll be lodging these slides later, but uh, Robin has a, a talk actually about how she put together um, her first textbook, so that's, that's available. Um, the uh, OpenCon, an annual conference uh, about these resources, uh, Robin was saying, you know, you, you've got to go to this. Uh, there's so many things available through the site. Uh, they, they really talk about, again, you know, what are open educational resources? You know, why do they need them? They link to a lot of different studies um, showing, you know, talking about student success um, and those sorts of things. And then I talked a little bit about the, the LibGuide here at the, at the UK Institutional Repository, again, outlining some of the resources available for this. And she pointed me to several other LibGuides uh, that she also found very helpful. So those, those will be good resources for, for people wanting to dig in further. And with that, I will turn it over to, to Jeff, who is looking at these issues on a, a more statewide and collaborative level.